All right, welcome to our second episode from chapter one. And this episode is arguably the most important from this chapter because it's in, it's in this episode that we're going to learn about the scientific method. All right, and we're going to talk about the scientific method as we go throughout the academic year because it truly is the foundation of a science. Okay, now the scientific method is a series of steps and techniques that's used to discover new knowledge, correcting old knowledge. And also as a way to kind of integrate uh, previous knowledge so it all fits in one nice little neat package. Okay, so what are the steps to the scientific method? And as you can see down here, there's seven steps to them. Now you'll notice that I have the first letter in each step in the color blue because I have a very funny mnemonic device to help you remember the steps of the scientific method. It's called OC the funny carp. OC the funny carp. The O stands for observation of phenomena, and phenomena is basically the stuff that happens out in the world. Okay, C for creating a question. Any good scientist will see a phenomenon happen and go, huh, why did that happen? Okay, now the F is forming a hypothesis. Okay, when you form a hypothesis, you are creating a possible answer for that question in the previous step. The fourth is the controlled experiment. The controlled experiment is when you create the data. So therefore the fifth step is analyze the data and then you're gonna make a conclusion. Does the data support the hypothesis? That's a yes or no question. You're going to repeat your experiment. You wanna make sure that the steps are not a fluke. And then finally peer review. Basically you're gonna have other scientists double check and, and sort of grade your lab report. Okay, now over here in this picture, we just have a graphic that explains what we have here. You're observing, you're creating a question, you are forming a hypothesis, you do the controlled experiment, now you analyze and make a conclusion, and then you're going to repeat it, and then you do, uh, you publish it so that other scientists can review it. There's your peer review. All right, on to the next slide. Let's look at each one of these steps in a little bit more detail. Okay, remember, OC, the funny carp. All right, the first one is, what is phenomena? And phenomena, basically, let me rephrase this. The first step is observation of phenomena. So what is phenomena? Well, phenomena is simply facts or occurrences that can be observed. In other words, it's the stuff that happens in the world that you can observe it using your five sentences, okay? The C means create a question, and remember, when you create a question, you're going to use the five W's and the one H. The who, what, when, where, and how. All right, now, you see this little asterisk right there? A very well-worded question will create a really, really good hypothesis. And a really good hypothesis is a major, major step in creating a very nice and elegant experiment. So let's move on to the next one. All right, forming a hypothesis. The definition of a hypothesis according to your book is, it's a possible answer to why the phenomena occurred. The scientist will expect his hypothesis to be correct. It is in fact a prediction. Now, you are going to write your hypothesis, let's pick a different color than that. Your hypothesis will be written always in an if-then statement. Now, your, your current teacher that you have, if you're watching this on YouTube, or if you're one of my students and one of your middle school teachers, they may have had you write a hypothesis as an if, then, because. I typically do not write the because part, but it's actually very, very good. So if you are comfortable with writing an if, then, and because, you knock yourself out. There is nothing wrong with that, okay? And that because part really focuses in in the fact that it is a prediction. Now, really, really important stuff down here. Make sure you make a note of these in your notes uh, because you are gonna need to know this on your test. The if part refers to the independent variable. Sometimes it's referred to as a manipulated variable. In other words, the if part is the change that you're putting between the two experimental groups and you want to see what that change causes, all right? So that's the independent variable. 
is what you're kind of actually testing. The dependent variable or the responding variable is going to create the data. So when you think of responding or, or dependent variable, I want you to think of data, okay? These are the actual changes that you're going to see, okay? So independent variable, that's the variable that you're actually testing. The dependent variable depends on the independent variable and it's going to create the data. So think of dependent variable as your data, all right? Now if you're using these terms in your class, manipulated and responding, manipulated means man. So this is the one that man or you have changed in your experiment. The responding variable are what were the changes that were called. In other words, how did the data respond when you made that manipulated change? Right? Hopefully that made sense to you. If you have any questions, see me in class or ask your teacher if you're one of the viewers on YouTube. All right, on to step number four. All right, so we got our great hypothesis. It's written in an if-then statement and possibly an if-then because. Now we need to do a controlled experiment because this is what the test is going to be to see if our hypothesis is correct. In other words, is our prediction correct? Now, a hypothesis is going to have two different groups. The first group is called the control group. It has no variable, so it's not going to have a manipulated or responding variable. It's not going to have an independent variable or a dependent variable. It's simply going to be there for comparison. So if you look over here in this picture, here's your control group. It's got nothing being added to it. All right. The experimental group is going to have both of the variables. And remember, both uh, variables are the independent. Let me get myself caught up here and get this written. And the other one is going to be the dependent variable. Okay, now remember, the independent variable, that is what is being tested. Whoops. That's a very bad looking eye. There we go. Okay, and remember, when we write a hypothesis, that's going to be the if part. And then the dependent variable is essentially the data. And remember, in our hypothesis, that was the then part. And I went over this uh, uh, pretty good detail last uh, slide, so I'm gonna zip through this one a little bit quicker, but make sure you write all this stuff down. <clears throat> all right, the independent variable, remember, it's deliberately changed. It's the difference between the control group and the experimental group. And you wanna remember, this is the if part in your hypothesis. The responding variable is the change that was caused by it, all right? So this can be an observed and measured. So when you see the word observed and measured, I want you to think of data, all right? So remember the dependent variable, this is the then part of your, um, of your hypothesis, okay? Uh, lots of colors on here. This should be a note to you that when you see a bunch of colors, that means it's important. So just to give you a little bit of a hint, you might want to know what these two words mean on your test or your quizzes. Just saying, trying to help you out. You better know this stuff. Got it? All right. Now, we've got all this data. We've done our controlled experiment. Uh, what are we going to do with this data? Well, data is going to come in two flavors. And then what you do with it is dependent on what the flavors are. All right. So let's look at the two flavors of, of data. All right. Number one is quantitative. These are numbers. Scientists love numbers because one of the things that you can do with numbers really well is you can graph it, okay? When you look at a graph, the numbers, well, really, let me rephrase this, all right? Numbers are always trying to tell you something. And when you put them in a graph, the message that the numbers are trying to tell you just pops off the screen. Humans are really good at understanding pictures. We get pictures. So if we can put our numbers in a picture, we can understand them a little bit better. All right. Sometimes our experiments cannot create uh, numbers. So we're going to uh, collect qualitative data. This would be descriptive. Okay. Qualitative would be like you're describing color. Um, you're describing, um, let's see, what would be another one? A, a behavior. Okay. So this would be just uh, of a behavior. 
Like if you're, you know, Jane Goodall and you're out in the in the jungle looking at the chimps and you're describing their behavior, that would be quant. I'm sorry, qualitative. <clears throat> All right, I want you to look up here at this uh, at this uh, graph, right? Or I mean, rephrase this: this table. All right, and this deals with computers. All right, so we're looking at quantitative. Remember, this is number. The chip speed is two gigahertz, which is not uncommon for uh, a one or two year old laptop. Okay, subjective. On a scale of 1 to 10, my computer scores a 7 in terms of its ease of use, okay? Now, that's subjective means it's an opinion, okay? Objective means it's a fact, all right? So, let's go here. Fact, opinion, okay? Now, that's a fact. That's how fast it goes. You can measure it, okay? On a, one, a scale of 1 to 10, that's an opinion, okay? Now, probably the reason why this person's computer only scored a 7 because it was a Windows machine and not a Mac. Now, that is also a subjective um, notation because that's my opinion. But if you're a Mac user, you'll know that's pretty much a fact, all right? Now, qualitative, yes, I own a computer. That's a fact, that's true. You got a receipt, it's yours, okay? Uh, subjective, I think computers are too expensive, okay? Now, I'm a Mac user, they're too expensive. I would consider that a fact, but it's really subjective. Now, we've collected all of this data. What are we going to use it for? The collection of data is used for the conclusion. Is my hypothesis correct? If it is, the data should support why it is. If it's not correct, the data is telling you, hey, your hypothesis is not correct. Now, if your hypothesis is not correct, that's okay. We can go back, tweak our experiment, and figure out why our hypothesis went wrong, okay? We can always change our hypothesis to fit the data. That is good science. Okay, why would I want to repeat my, um, my, re or my experiment? Well, consistent data provides better evidence, okay? We want to make sure that what we got in our data was not a fluke. It should not be a one-time occurrence. This should happen time and time and time again. That really supports your ideas. All right, let's move on to the last one. All right, peer review. This is really, really important when it comes to the scientific method. All right, um, you need to let other scientists in the field look at your work. They're going to double check your. Um, <clears throat> they're going to double check your work to make sure that it is correct. All right, it's kind of like they're grading each other. They're trying to make sure that the data that you are presenting is correctly interpretive and the data is telling you what's happening. Now, how do you do this? Well, you can email among your, your colleagues. Um, you can do face-to-face -face conversations using Skype and FaceTime. Uh, you could use GoToMeeting. Uh, you could do a Google Hangout. Uh, all kinds of things for face-to-face -face talk between you and your colleagues. Uh, one of the best ones is a presentation at a conference a webinar, a symposium, or whatnot, where you're in an auditorium, you're presenting your results, and the other scientists in the audience can discuss it, okay? But the most common one is you need to publish it in a scientific journal like Nature. Now, Nature is the most widely read scientific journal in the world. It's published out of England, and a close second is called Science Magazine. This one is published in the United States, and these two are arguably the top journals for peer review. So let's review, all right? Remember, I have a really nice mnemonic device. O-C, the funny carp, okay? Observe phenomenon, oh, that's crazy, there we go. Observe phenomenon, create a question, form a hypothesis, a controlled experiment, analyze the results and make a conclusion, repeat to make sure that your results were not a fluke, and then very importantly, peer review. All right, kind of a long episode. I really don't like him to go this long, but I couldn't help it on this one. So we're gonna end it right here. Make sure you watch this episode maybe one other time. If you have any questions, ask your teacher. So until the next time, we're gonna see you on the flip side.